This is the CRI Saturn 35mm T 2.9 anamorphic lens. Let's check it out today. We're going to be joined by Dustin in just a second who's going to go over the technical aspects of this lens, but I'm just going to give you a couple of details first uh, to start things off. So yes, this is a anamorphic 35mm full frame lens and it comes in two different options. It comes in a neutral flare option where your flares are going to kind of just be that basic white light or it comes in a blue flare option where your flares are going to be streaked in blue. Now it has an aperture range of T2.9 to T16. It comes with a 10 bladed iris and the minimum focus distance is uh, 0 0.9 meters. 0 0.9 meters of course to infinity and today we are reviewing it on the sony ema all right for your technical talk let's head over to dustin all right thanks craig so i'm going to give you a quick breakdown of some of the actual specs of the lens itself some of the build and handling and then just some general observations in using it so our biggest advantage when it comes to this particular lens is the fact that it really is very compact and very lightweight so at only 103 millimeters in length or four inches, and its weight is only 415 grams or about 0 0.9 pounds. That makes even using it on a drone a, an actual option. Obviously you're gonna have to have a high-end drone to do that, but the you know very light weight and then size does open up some extra creative opportunities with this lens. Part of that is that they have used some real carbon fiber in the barrel destruction to help to keep the weight down. Now, obviously with any kind of cine lens, you're gonna get some standardization when it comes to both the aperture ring and then the manual focus ring, both of which here on the barrel are set up for gearing. The weight on them, it's nice and smooth. There is, the damping is what I would call on the reasonably heavy side and that it does take a bit of force, but not so much you couldn't do it with a gearing or drive system. There's 120 degrees of focus rotation. And so to me, it's, it's not in a bad spot. However, some of you might prefer a slightly longer focus throw. What I do like is the fact that you can do longer focus pulls without just a whole lot of rotation. Now, as noted, it is a T2.9, and so that corresponds roughly to an F2.8 uh, aperture size measured by light transmission here. So obviously it's not incredibly bright, but you know, bright enough for many shots. And of course, that's another reason why the size and the weight is relatively small. The Aperture Iris has 10 aperture blades, and as noted, it does give you that cinematic kind of oval shape to the bokeh and the specular highlights. Now this is, lens is available in actually a wide variety of different mounts. Now we've tested in the E-mount version for Sony, but we've also got the typical mounts like Canon RF, we've got a Fuji X mount, we've got Leica L mount, we've got a Nikon Z or Z mount. There's also a unique DL mount for DJI mounts, which I've not actually tested anything on that, but if you do, it exists. There's also two different options when it comes to the flare signature for this. So we've tested the neutral. There's also the blue streak version, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Now the 35 millimeter focal length because of the constant 1.6 squeeze actually gives a horizontal uh, point of view of a 22 millimeter lens. And so if we take a look at another 35 millimeter lens, in this case, I set up a tripod, did the same shot with the Sony 35 millimeter F1.4 G Master lens, and then I shot it with this lens. And so you can see that it is incredibly wider in the Sirai Saturn lens here. And so definitely a much wider angle of view. Now, general observations just in using the lens on the technical side, I did note that even after de-squeezing, there is some pronounced pincushion distortion that you're gonna particularly see on the edges. Because this is such a wide squeeze, you don't see the distortion so much in the top and the bottom of the frame. You see it on the extreme wide ends. And so, uh, for example, if you take a look at this shot just of my living room, I did not attempt to correct the actual distortion. I just de-squeezed it. And you can see if you look at the edges of the frame, there is an inward bulge. 
Now in the second shot, I not only did the 1.6D squeeze, but then I also did a correction in DaVinci Resolve of the pin cushion distortion. And you can see that the lines look nice and clean. Now, if you are not accustomed to doing that uh, correction, just so you know, I dialed in a minus 0.08 to account for the pincushion distortion on the edges of the frame. It's probably better to do that after you de-squeeze it and so everything looks a little bit more natural when you do that. Now coming back to those flare options for a moment. The blue streak uh, flare is designed for a particular look. It is a very cinematic look. You'll see it in a lot of, of films, but the reason why I went for the neutral option here is that while there are certain situations where the you know, the, the blue tint looks a little bit cooler. For example, in this shot of headlight starting up, you can see that the natural flare isn't maybe quite as cinematic. But I do find that the neutral flare is a little bit more versatile in the different kind of shots you can do. Obviously, your mile, mileage may vary, so if you're going to choose this lens, choose the option that best suits your cinematic style. Now, here is a sequence I actually shot when I was alone because I had COVID a couple of months ago. And so I shot a this little kind of sequence, just kind of testing out the lens and playing with it. And so what I found as a part of testing the, the lens and then editing the footage is that the sharpness is good, but it's not exceptional. So if you're looking for the sharpest lens out there, I wouldn't say that this is the sharpest lens, but what I did find is that the lens had a very cinematic quality, just in the overall look of the footage that my conventional non-cine lenses just aren't able to match. And so I think that the overall look of the lens is great, but it's not, you know, top of the charts when it comes to sharpness. I also found that chromatic aberrations seem to be well controlled. And uh, you can see from some of these shots that fringing is really minimal. And so that's certainly a plus. And I found that even when I was shooting with a window frame in the background, and it's, it's kind of shocking to me how often I see in, in footage of, you know, of serious shows or movies, when I see chromatic aberrations in the fringes around window frames. And I, I, I never quite understand why those are left uncorrected. That's not going to be an issue with this lens. It could handle those kind of shots nice and clean. Then the final thing that I want to comment on is that if you're looking to do any kind of close-up shot, this lens has a very poor minimum focus distance for what is a 22 millimeter equivalent focal length. At 0.9 meters, that's 90 centimeters, you are a fair ways away from the camera to the subject and obviously with a very wide angle of view you're not going to be able to get close at all. So close-up shots are not part of the reality of this lens, so don't buy it with doing those kind of shots in mind. But my conclusion was is that if you accept the limitations of the lens and use it around it, uh, it really does provide some really great looking footage. It was a lens that I enjoyed playing with. Back to you, Craig. Let's talk about my experience in using this lens. So first of all, uh, recall some of the cinematic lenses that we've used on this channel before. Uh, they've been, you know, rather quite big. Whereas this anamorphic lens comes in uh, both with a small kind of footprint in its, in its lens body, but also is very lightweight. It's got a carbon fiber body construction. So uh, very, very usable in a bunch of different situations. It's easy to put up on a gimbal. It's got gearings on its iris and focus rings. So uh, a very adaptable lens, lightweight, easy to carry around for sure. Uh, now this lens does offer a unique 1.6 times squeeze factor. And so depending on the um, video editing software that you use, there's different ways to go about using that, right? Because looking at it uh, on your you know, viewfinder, for example, on your LCD screen on your camera body, uh, it's gonna look pretty messed up. It's gonna look pretty messed up. So I would absolutely suggest, I would strongly suggest using a uh, additional kind of attachment screen, uh, a screen that's gonna be able to, a field monitor that's going to be able to de-squeeze the image. Now, uh, some of these shots here that you see, you can get away without having a field monitor on you. And that's what I did here for these uh, landscape shots and you can get away with it because you just close down the aperture right and you set the focus to about where it's going to be and, and you can get away with it now you will notice some of these um, 
some of these pieces of footage do have a softer focus to them because you know, I did kind of miss, I didn't have the field monitor on me. Um, I definitely don't suggest going around with this lens without a field monitor and just, you know, looking at the, the non-squeezed image on your uh, LCD screen on your camera body and trying to find focus. Cause for example, it, it's not really achievable. Even if you put focus peaking on, it, it's not gonna work. For example, this footage of the statue here, right? Um, peaking, I'm not using a field monitor, I'm just using the camera, that's it. Uh, peaking said that that statue was in focus when clearly it is not, all right? So you need a field monitor, you can't hack it, you can't go about in a cheap way and think you're gonna find focus. And even with a field monitor, uh, setting this shot up, for example, it, it is a little bit tricky. It is a little bit tricky, but what you can do, for example, uh, this review is on the Sony E-mount. Sony camera bodies come with an option to zoom in to check focus. So go ahead, use that. You may have to hit you know, menu, go into the different settings, go into AF, MF menu, and then go into there and you know, blow it up, check your focus, make sure about it, all right? And you know, whenever you get focus, uh, appropriately made. This looks good. Um, there is this trend going around on YouTube of how to make everything look cinematic, right? There's a bunch of uh, color grading tutorials, how to make your footage look cinematic. Well, hey, if you want to make your footage look cinematic, get an anamorphic lens, right? All this space out here. That's pretty crazy. This is 35 millimeters. Let me, let me see my arm spread out. You know, you, you can see the whole entire back wall. This, this is cinematic. All right, it's cool. Now, the 1.6 times squeeze factor, how do you edit that? Because if you're going to bring that into your video editing platform and use it, it's gonna look really, really weird, all right? So I'm a DaVinci Resolve user. Here's what you do in DaVinci Resolve. You bring, first of all, your media into the media pool and you can select all of the clips here that you want to de-squeeze, all right? So you're gonna right click on the clip uh, select clip attributes. You're going to head down to this little subheader and you're going to put in a custom ratio. DaVinci Resolve doesn't have a 1.6 times uh, squeeze factor. as 1.5, so it gets really close, but all you have to do is just go to custom, set it to 1.6, and all of your footage will now look appropriate. Now, of course, you don't necessarily have to stick, uh, stick to this kind of ratio, right? You can you can blow it up, you can do whatever you want, all right? The world is yours, so go ahead and do what you would like. Now, let's talk about uh, experience using the lens. Um, it's pretty cool, it's pretty cool. Again, absolutely recommend using a field monitor, all right? So you can check your focus, get uh, good reliable shots, but uh, it's really nice and easy to use, lightweight, right? You can pop it up on a gimbal, it comes with uh, gearing on the iris and aperture, or sorry, iris and focus rings. Uh, so you can use, you know, a focus throw tool to help you do that if that is in your production. It was a really pleasant experience in using this lens. Now, uh, something I also want to know is that it does have a constant 1.6 times squeeze factor so that as you pull your focus, um, the subject size doesn't change too much as you pull your focus. Now, something you will note is, for example, in this shot, the edges of the lens do start to curve straight lines, all right? So as I pull across, you're gonna see this light pole here. It bends, you know, on one side, and then it bends on the other. Uh, so just be aware of that. So this lens is, you know, it's a cinematic lens. You get that nice, wide cinematic anamorphic look. You get the oval bokeh, you get the light streaks going on uh, from the light sources in the background. It's got all the features you would want for your next cinematic production. Plus, it is extremely short, just uh, measuring in at four inches, very light carbon fiber construction. Um, really, what this comes down to is it comes at a price point of right now it's on sale for $1,100. So does this lens have the characteristics that you're looking for for your next production? Uh, that is a decision only you can make. I certainly enjoyed using this lens. Uh, and if you purchase it, then I hope you do as well. That is it for today. I hope you take care. Purchasing links are down below. Take care, have a great day, and remember to let the light in.